Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday night uh, webinar series here. We have the pleasure of, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Sapka. He's going to be doing Dr. IC double diagnosed and managing patients with neurogenic diplopia. I don't know why this always happens. We always lose you. Here we go. Dr. Joe Sapka is attending optometric physician at Center for Sight in Sarasota and Venice, Florida, which he which is a large medical surgical practice where he focuses on glaucoma and neuro-ophthalmic disease. I think you're going to see his talents tonight uh, with this lecture on diplopia. He is the residency education coordinator at Center for Sight. He is also the director of optometric business development for USI. He was formerly professor of optometry at Nova Southeastern University College of Optometry for 28 years, where he served numerous academic and administrative roles. Dr. Sapka is the founding member of both the Optometric Glaucoma Society and the Optometric Retina Society. He is also the founder and former chair of the Neuroophthalmic Disorders and Optometry Special Interest Group for the American Academy of Optometry. Dr. Salka is a glaucoma diplomat for the American Academy of Optometry. And in 2021 and 2022, he was ranked number four optometrist in, U in the U.S. by Newsweek Magazine, America's Best Eye Doctors list. In 2023, he surpassed that. He skipped over two, he skipped over three, and went right to number one, being the number one optometrist in U.S. Newsweek uh, ratings. Joe, congratulations on that. He is a partner and co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. Joe, I think I hear a big round of applause. The virtual floor is all yours. Well, thank you, Greg. Uh, tonight, we're going to be Dr. IC Double. How to diagnose and manage patients with neurogenic diplopia. It is a fairly uh, expansive uh, discipline here. I certainly see double vision uh frequently in my in my role at Center for Sight, USI. Uh, these are my disclosures. I have been uh, in the Speakers and Advisory Bureau for Bausch & Lohm, but all of my relationships have been mitigated. I am with Greg, co-owner of Optometric Education Consultants. For the disclosures, I work in a large medical surgical practice. I'm not in an academic referral center. I have, I'm booking 25 to 30 patients per day. That is primary care, glaucoma, coronal disease, uh, contact lenses, emergencies, and I do the neuro-ophthalmic care uh, in, in my practice. I function really pretty much the way everybody does here today. And I don't have two hours to do a neuro-op evaluation. It's sort of... Uh, almost like a mash unit when it comes to neural op. I've got to have a good idea of what's happening by the time I meet with a patient and we do our testing and we make our determinations as to what to do. I'm going to try to share this with you in a practical uh, manner that people can be, uh, can be comfortable with this. Now, there are numerous ocular motility problems out there. There's the, the decompensating non-paralytic strabismus, uh, which we're not going to talk about tonight. We're going to spend most of our talk, time talking about paralytic strabismus. That is paralysis of either cranial nerve 3, cranial nerve 4, or cranial nerve 6. We're going to talk about brainstem disease. I'll try to keep out of the weeds on that one. And we have to understand that double vision can come from a number of, uh, of places. It can be the nerve, it can be the muscle, it can be the tendon, which people don't are not aware of, and it can be abnormalities at the neuromuscular junction. So looking at a little bit of anatomy, we got the medial rectus, which is inward uh, movement. We have lateral rectus, which is the outward movement. The superior rectus, which is upward movement. The inferior rectus, which is downward movement. The su superior oblique, which is down and out. And the inferior rectus, it, uh, superior rectus is uh, up, uh, upward. Up, uh, inferior oblique is up and, up and out. And superior oblique is, is down and out. Now we have a lot of area to cover here. We got the we have the midbrain, we have the pons and mesencephalon. Six, you know, we have three we have three cranial nerves that move the eye, three, four, and six. 
One of them is way down here in the ponds, and the other two are way up here in the dorsal mesencephalon, and they're not really all that close together in the brainstem. And there is connection uh, of neural superhighways that uh, connect these all together so that they can work synchronously. Now we're going to talk a little bit of ocular physiology, some of the stuff that we needed to learn for NBO part one. But you're going to see what really where this becomes clinically applicable and helpful. We've got ductions and versions. Ductions are just the movement of one eye independent of the other. We're looking only at one eye. Versions, we're looking at both eyes. And hopefully, versions are synchronous and symmetrical, and the patient doesn't have double vision. Now, if we were to cover one eye or to do the versions, we see there is an underaction. If we cover the non paretic eye, if the paretic eye can still move further out with more effort, saying that ductions are better than versions, that is pretty characteristic of a neurogenic ophthalmoparesis. Now, if you cover the good fixating eye and the paretic eye doesn't move, the underacting eye doesn't move on its own, well, we're probably dealing with uh, a muscular issue or we could, an entrapment issue. There's also Sherrington's law of reciprocal innervation. If a person were here to wanting to look to the left, we have to have a certain innervation of the lateral rectus, and there has to be an equal disinnervation of the medial rectus of the same eye. Otherwise, it doesn't move. Now, Herring's law of equal innervation, and we're going to talk more about this uh, a bit later, the yoke muscles have to have equal innervation. In order to look to the left, the left lateral rectus and the left medial rectus have to have the same innervation so that they maintain foveation and fixation symmetrically. If something happens to break that down, the patient can be diplopic. So that is some information that we knew a long time ago in terms of ocular physiology, but we're going to see where that is actually very helpful when I talk about uh, some of the cranial neuropathies a little bit later. Now, there are five questions that we have to ask and answer. Is, is the diplopia real? Is it present monocularly? Is it horizontal or vertical? Does it get worse in a particular direction of gaze? And is it greater distance or near? Now we don't really ask the patient this. We, you know, we say, is it one eye or both? Is it side by side or up and down? Is it worse left and right, or is it further away or up close? And I can tell you right now, patients don't have these answers for the most part when they come in. Only the most fastidious patient can answer these. Most of them will tell you what's bothering me. I get double vision when I drive. I get I get hor I get side by side double when I'm driving. I get up and down double vision when I'm reading. These are all things they can tell us, but that's about it. You know, they don't they won't have the answers. They don't, they won't be able to tell you everything. You ask them a question, and they'll say usually, oh, I never I, I never really thought about it. And then we have to go through the examination and uh, just see where the where the limitations are. So first thing, you know, is it is it real? The first thing I, I, I tell people is, you know, try you know, just try and talk them out of it. You know, you're not really double, are you? You know, your your seg height's a little bit off. Your glasses are a little tilted. You know, you know, tr first of all, try to talk them out of it. Now, if you can't talk them out of it. Is it present in one eye or the other? And I'll challenge them in the room. I'll put something up on the eye chart and cover one eye. Is it still there? Uh, and if it is, we have monocular double vision. We always tech test both eyes. I think last week I had two cases of monocular double vision. One was cataract. One was capsular pacification. But... Monocular double vision is not neurologic. These patients don't need neuroimaging. It's something refractive, keratoconus, some corrective refractive error. It might be a ghosting, you know, with astigmatism and ghosting. Is it is it ghosting or is it double? 
Uh, cataract. When I first developed a dense, milky, nuclear cataract in my right eye, not only did I have monocular double vision, I, I had triplopia. I actually saw three things. I looked at the dashboard on my car, the little D, there's one above it and one to the right. I actually had triplopia. So cataract can do it. Other things, surface disease, best thing to do is, is put up the pinhole. You put up the pinhole, goes away, you're going to find something probably pretty straightforward. It's going to be something very superficial, but monocular double vision is not neurogenic. And put up the pinhole, it will help you a lot. Now, we have to see, is it horizontal or is it vertical? We look at uh, how, the, how the muscles work, what they do. Horizontal double vision is one of four muscles. It's one of the two lateral rectus muscles, or it's two of the medial rectus muscles. And I'm going to tell you right now, this, this is the first time I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it several times. There are no medial rectal palsies, okay? Say it with me, everybody. There are no medial rectus palsies. Those don't exist. It's something that is mimicking it. It is an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. It is myasthenia gravis. It's muscular con uh, contraction or restriction. It is not a partial third nerve palsy. Vertical double vision can be one of eight muscles. The superior rectus, inferior rectus, superior oblique, or inferior oblique on each eye. So we're going down. We're going from 12 to 8 or 4. Horizontal double vision, worse to the right, are, is going to be two, two muscles. It's either the right lateral rectus or left medial rectus, and there is no such thing as a medial rectus palsy. It's something else that's mimicking that. Vertical double vision, worse to the left, four possible muscles, the inferior or superior oblique on the right side or left superior inferior rectus uh, on the other side. Horizontal worse than near is medial rectus, and there are no medial rectus palsies. Horizontal worse at distance is going to be one of the two lateral recti. Uh, wow. You get that one, Greg? And vertical double vision worse at near is one of the superior blinks. So if you work through and categorize it, you can figure out what muscles involved. If you know what muscles involved, you know what nerve can be involved. Once you know what nerve can be involved, when you look at the patient profile, we can look at some of the likely suspects. So is it real? And what was the onset? An acute onset can be vascular pathic, can be aneurysmal, it can be a number of things, but vascular pathic is fairly common, particularly in patients who have ischemic vascular disease, and they usually last uh, without complications for about three months. Is it getting better or getting worse? Something that is progressively getting worse could be compressional, could be inflammatory, could be aneurysmal. Something that has happened suddenly is now getting progressively better can be ischemic. Something that is variable could be neuromuscular junction and myasthenia gravis. And we can't forget about spatial temporality. What happens in time and space? We ask the patient, when did he first start noticing double vision? What happened just before you had double vision? Is there anything different? We, we can't do the most comprehensive history, but we open-end it and ask the patient, what happened at about the time that you noticed double vision? It will help lead us down the right diagnostic path. Spatial temporality, things that happen in time and space, very important. Is it isolated to just three, four, or six? Are there travelers involved? What is the pupil status? What is the eyelid position? Is there hemiparesis numbness? Is there a intention tremor? Is there ataxia to their gait? These are all things we have to look at in making our initial assessment.
So I'm going to start off with a 63-year-old man who has a sudden onset of orbital pain of three days duration. And it's head pain and retroorbital pain, which by his account is pretty severe. It happens on a Friday, gets worse on a Saturday, it's very bad on Sunday, and he comes in on Monday because I'm his eye doctor. I treat him for a glaucoma. He's got diabetes and hypertension. He's on Coumadin, and he has a pacemaker. These are all important parts of the story. When we look at him, we can see he's got a partial ptosis, and the eyelid looks like it's a little bit exotropic and maybe a little bit hypotropic. And I can tell you, having seen him before, this is all new. So when we lift his lid, he cannot look up. He cannot look down. He can AB duct, but he cannot AD duct. So he has adduction, depression, and elevation deficits in the face of a partial ptosis. So we're dealing with medial, medial rectus, inferior rectus, superior rectus, inferior oblique. When we look at his pupils, he has got a reactive pupil on the left. He has got a mid-dilated, totally unresponsive pupil on the right. I think it's pretty clear that we are dealing with a person who has a pupil involved right partial third nerve palsy. So polling question number one, what is the likely cause? Is it an intracranial aneurysm? Is it a brain tumor? Is it inflammation or is it ischemia? All right, Joe, I launched the handout. I was able to download the most current one. So thank you. I just put it into the waiting room for everyone that's out there. And so, if I had the old one, it would not be it would not be devastating. Okay. So if you want to download it, it's there. If you want to email me, I can send it to you. Now they're on fire tonight. We got 82% already. My people are people are in. People are going. Excellent. Okay. So most people say an intracranial aneurysm, and I think that's the one thing that we have to first uh, think about in a partial third, uh, even without pupil involvement. Brain tumor, usually an apoplectic inflammation can always be there, and ischemia certainly is a possibility with his history, but first and foremost, we really have to consider that he has an intracranial aneurysm. Brings me to polling question number two, what's the best referral for this patient? Is a neuro-ophthalmologist, a neurologist, a neurosurgeon, a hospital emergency room, or an internist? People responding really quickly. You know, interesting, Greg, uh, this past weekend, I was on another, another webinar for another group, and uh, it really took forever to get through the polling questions. People were just mm -hmm. not, uh, not, not, uh, not snapping off like our audience is. There you go. All right. So the majority of people say a hospital emergency room, and generally speaking, that's probably the most efficient thing that we can do. For a patient, if we suspect there's an intracranial aneurysm, which is what we should be doing in this presentation. Now, where is it? Let's talk about anatomy. Mostly we're talking about out of the circular world, it's the posterior communicating artery. Now, you can have an aneurysm at the, at the junction of the PCOM artery and the internal carotid artery, or maybe at the tip of the basilar, but you're in the right anatomic neighborhood. The importance of the pupil, the pupil and motor fibers will coat the third nerve uh, in subarachnoid space. 
So something that extends and compresses the pupillary motor fibers will affect the pupillary function. The pupillary function diminishes. The pupil will slight, somewhat dilate, but will also be very poorly reactive. Also, the lid will be totic, and we will have ophthalmoparesis. You are not going to get an aneurysm that compresses the third nerve that does that affects only the pupil and doesn't affect lid or motility. That doesn't happen. Now, in ischemic vascular palsies, mostly diabetic and hypertensive patients, there's a rich anastomotic uh, blood supply to those external pupillary fibers, and they maintain their function, but the core of the nerve becomes infarcted. So we'll have a totic lid, we'll have ophthalmoparesis, but there will still be normal pupil function. It won't be dilated and it will be reactive. And in subarachnoid space, the posterior communicating artery runs parallel to the third cranial nerve. They're relatively close together. Now, you need an aneurysm of at least five millimeters to be picked up on imaging. So if the vessel and the nerve are very close anatomically and the aneurysm is less than five millimeters, it can be missed. That's why you have to look at the other clinical findings. Conversely, if the third nerve and the vessel are relatively anatomically separated, it could take a pretty large aneurysm in order to uh, make compression. Now, 50% of these patients will die from aneurysmal rupture. They fill, blood fills the cranial vault, only so much space. Brainstem herniates down through frame and magnum. Respiratory collapse ensues. The patient can die. Half of these patients will die from aneurysm rupture, and it usually happens within 29 days. 20% of patients will die within 48 hours from rupture of the aneurysm. And this patient came to me after 72 hours. So he sat with an aneurysm for 72 hours. These patients need emergency care. Time counts. So you may say, just ship it to the ER. Well, this is your typical ER physician when they encounter a patient with an eye problem. They're very intelligent. They are, they're very skilled. They're very knowledgeable, but they don't have the experience or the confidence in the eye that we have. If we can help them, Tell them what we're looking for, why we're looking for it, and what to do. It's going to enhance the patient outcome. So this is a situation, the exam is very short, probably took me about 10 minutes. Most of it was uh, in, in education of the patient and his wife. Sent to the ER detail, the detailed notes, my recommendation, and my cell phone number. I also call the triage nurse in advance. I tell the patient, you're not going to wait at the ER. You're getting the Disney Fast Pass. Greg, I know it's an old term. What, what do they call it now? I think it's called the lightning lane. The lightning lane. I call. I still call it Disney Fast The lightning lane or Fast Pass, you're getting to the front of the line. I call up. People involved right third nerve palsy most likely cause an intracranial aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. And at this point, whenever I have been in this situation, or I have been in this situation before, it is very stereotypic. And this is at the point where the triage nurse will say, could you hold on for a second? Let me get the doctor on, uh, on the floor. We have the conversation. Need CT, CTA, and a neurosurgical consult stat. He couldn't have an MRI because he had a pacemaker. I can say that from the time he walked out of my front door to the time that he was on a CT scanner, it was only 45 minutes. He was found to have a leaking but unruptured aneurysm on CTA. He was hospitalized for 23 days. He underwent two endovascular procedures where they packed coils in that aneurysm. His ptosis improved. His motility and pupil did not improve, but he did live. He is still alive today. So what are we looking at here? 
third nerve palsy. It's an eye that's down and out with ptosis, adduction, elevation, depression, deficits. As we discussed earlier, they may be isochoric or anisochoric. And we'll look at a couple of rules in just a second. Now, this is the anatomy of the third nerve. Now, it begins up here in the brainstem, the mesencephalon with the nucleus, and fascicles going through the red nucleus, the corticospinal tract. Now, anything happening up here in the brainstem, there's no nerve. These are nerve fascicles. There's no big blood vessels. There's no aneurysms here. And there's no isolated third nerve palsies here. They're going to have hemiparesis, intention tremors, ataxic gait. They will have other things going on. In this area here, this is subarachnoid, this is the danger zone. If there is a bleed of one of, of the vessel here compressing the third third nerve, it the blood will fill the cranial vault, that will be likely fatal. If a vessel ruptures within the cavernous sinus, it is still trapped within the venous system, the patient doesn't die. It's this area here that we have to worry about. So a partial or a complete third nerve palsy with pupil involvement or a partial third nerve palsy, regardless of the pupil, is an aneurysm first and foremost until proven otherwise. So dilated poorly reactive pupils compression, pain can be anything. It's only helpful if it's not there. Aneurysms are always painful. They, they touch pain-sensitive dural structures. They bleed and leak, and the blood irritates the men meninges. They're always painful. Ischemic vascular palsies, diabetic and hypertensive infarcts, are painful 90% of the time. So pain is only helpful if it's not there. And you can't characterize the pain. You can't think it's aneurysmal. It's going to be a, a boring, debilitating hemicranial pain. That doesn't always happen. Case in point, Temple University football player develops a third year, a third nerve palsy, aneurysm. Just has a little bit of headache. Little old lady, worst head pain of her life, diabetes. And a spared pupil does not always rule out an aneurysm. If the palsy is partial or incomplete, there could be an incipient aneurysm that's just beginning to expand and develop. So a pupil involved third is an aneurysm, the, the pecan artery until proven otherwise. An incomplete palsy is also an aneurysm until proven otherwise. Here she's got a little bit of ptosis and a little bit of underaction, but it's not a complete palsy. We have to consider that is an ensuing developing aneurysm, regardless of the pupil. Now, 30% of third nerve palsies are caused by aneurysm. I don't want to be here and tell you that there's a one in three chance that if you see a third nerve palsy tomorrow, it's being caused by an aneurysm. That's not what I'm saying. There are some patients that will have, based upon their clinical appearance, a 95% chance of having an aneurysm, and there are other patients who have a 5% chance. What I'm saying is they come from somewhere and about a third are aneurysm. Now, vasculopathic third nerve palsy from diabetes and hypertension will resolve in time, typically within 90 days, with no sequelae. But an aneurysm will rupture in time with an almost uniformly poor outcome. Now, imaging third nerve palsy, CT and CTA, right now, is the preferred non-invasive imaging for third nerve palsy. CT is great for finding subarachnoid hemorrhage. CT angiography is great for identifying the abnormal vessel. Now, CTA requires contrast. If they're renally impaired, MRI or MRE will be done. 
Now, CT is superior to MRI when the patient can't have an MRI. If they have a pacer, pacemaker, they're claustrophobic. And MRI is probably superior for the non-aneurysmal cases. Maybe it's inflammation or tumor. And an MRA adds very little time to the scan. The important thing to understand is we're looking for something in an artery. If you're looking for something in an artery, whatever the patient undergoes, a artery has to have an A in it, a CT angiogram or magnetic resonance angiogram because we're looking at the vasculature. A CT or MRI is insufficient. Probably the best thing that we could ever get would be if we had a device, one device that could do both an MRI and a CTA. You know, one device, two tests, MRI, CTA, that would be ideal. Now, a recent study actually looked at uh, third nerve palsies and how they were imaged and found the majority of third nerve palsy patients do not get the appropriate urgent imaging. You know, they're seen in a primary care office and are sent to an internist or they're sent to a neurologist or they're sent to an ophthalmologist or they don't get where they need to be right away. So the majority of third nerve palsies are not getting the appropriate urgent imaging. And these are patients in 2023 and sure 2024, they will get some sort of imaging. You have to be have some reason not to image a patient with a third nerve palsy. And the images are actually really, they put together quite well. They can identify the vessels uh, that are abnormal very, very well. So CTA and CT are probably the preferred non-invasive imaging for these patients. Now, some other clues. Average time from onset to rupture is about 29 days. 80% will rupture within 29 days. And many patients don't make the hospital. You're probably not wrong to order an ambulance for these patients. They have to get there. Now, there are two treatments for aneurysmal, uh, intracranial aneurysms. There is a craniotomy followed by an aneurysm clip. It's like you're putting a clip on a bag of potato chips. Or endovascular therapy will they actually go through the femoral artery with a catheter. They'll often put a stent in this area here, and they'll squeeze these coils in like toothpaste. It, they'll fill the aneurysm up, and if blood can't get in, it is highly unlikely to rupture at that point. Now, I've always been fond of saying that these patients or these procedures are relatively straightforward in the hands of a skilled neurosurgeon. And then uh, probably last year, I had a patient. She was a retired neurosurgeon. So we started talking about this, and she said, yeah, we really hate to use the aneurysm clips because, you know, once you open the dura, the dur it's always really bloody in there. You can't quite see what you're doing. And then all of a sudden, the, the aneurysm pops. You got blood all over the place. So nowadays, really, everybody is doing uh, coil packing endovascularly. There's much better uh, recovery time, uh, much less harsh on the patient. And they're about equal in terms of their outcomes. Now, here's a different patient and a different prognosis. She's a 63-year-old female who's got diabetes and hypertension who develops a sudden onset retroorbital pain. Now, here's the interesting thing. It's the pain that they complain about. Not the fact that you can't open your eye, or if you open your eye, you see, well, she complains about the pain. So she's got a complete tosis. We lift the lid. She cannot look up at all. She cannot look down at all. She cannot adduct at all, but she can abduct. So she is an older woman with a complete third nerve palsy, pupil sparing, vasculogenic risk factors. Which is better, one or two? Better one, better two. Can I see it again? She resolved over several weeks with no sequelae. 
he was hospitalized 23 days with two neurosurgical procedures. Now, when I talked about aneurysms, 30% uh, th of, of third nerve palsies are caused by aneurysm. These are two very different people. This is a person based upon his clinical characteristics, a partial third with pupil involvement, has a 95% risk of aneurysm. We see them clinically. This older woman, complete palsy, pupil sparing, she has about a 5% risk of having aneurysm. If ever a patient is not going to be imaged, it would be this woman here. This is a person who needs urgent imaging. He needed it in the hospital. He got it. This is a woman that if I were to see her clinically today or, or tomorrow, I would do the same thing. I would order the imaging myself. I would not send her to the hospital. I'd order CT, CTA, but I would have my office call the imaging center and get her in same day or next day. I know there's a very low risk of an aneurysm. Here's an 83-year-old male. He's diabetic, poorly controlled, last blood sugar is in the 300s, A1C around 11. Now, initially, he presented uh, to my university clinic when I was at university with a partial third nerve palsy, no pupil involved. That is a person who needs imaging right away. I'm seeing him in follow-up. He, he had an MRI that was ordered through his primary care physician. Rather than going to an imaging center or going to the hospital, the clinician involved sent the patient to the, 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 his internist, and the internist ordered an MRI, and I looked at the report, and it said indication for imaging was brain ischemia. Now, there are two mistakes that were made here. Mistake number one, the radiologist wasn't told to look for an aneurysm. And I'm not sure, I'm not, I'm not going to blame the internist. I'm sure the internist was probably overwhelmed with information. Somebody telling him there could be, we need to worry about an aneurysm, but he's badly diabetic. It's probably ischemic. That's the word that he heard and he understood. So he ordered brain ischemia. The radiologist is not looking for an aneurysm. And the other mistake, they ordered an MRI. There is no A in MRI. He, if you're looking for an A aneurysm, you have to look with something that has an A, either an MRA or a CTA. So just because they stick their head in the tube doesn't mean they're, they're going to find the right cause. The world's best neuroradiologist can't help you if you don't order the scan, order the right scan, and tell them what to look for. He's a 94-year-old male referred for a partial third nerve palsy. It is in my practice, is in another office. He had already been dilated by a technician in another office before I saw the patient. But they assured me that his pupils were, were not dilated and they were both reactive. As we take a look at him, he's got a little bit of vertosis. A little bit of an exo deviation. This is a subconscious hema. It has nothing to do with anything. Now, who's got no pain? Bob has no pain. In fact, he doesn't know what a headache is. He said he's never had a headache in his life. He is 94 years old. He's got a pacemaker. He's got high blood pressure. And he has got kidney disease. So, polling question number three. What is the likely cause? Is it an intracranial aneurysm, a brain tumor, is it inflammation, or is it ischemia? I'm going to go back here. Greg, looks like I'm caught up in the chat. Am I? You are. Yes. Is there anything you want to share here or discuss, Greg? Um, are, we, are we doing okay? No, we're doing good. Um, I've been helping a few people get in and sending some different things. So okay. kind of half 
going through listening. So, all right. But I did have a sixth nerve. I don't think you talked about that yet coming the other day. So, oh, we have that coming up. Yep. Partial third, already dilated. They tell me his pupils were normal. He has no head pain, doesn't know what a headache is, has never had a headache in his life. Is it an aneurysm? Is it a tumor? Is it inflammation or is it ischemia? Oh, we're slowing down on this one. <laughs> this is good old Bob. All right, we'll end it, share it. All right, so almost three quarters think it's ischemia. I hear intracranial aneurysm there, brain tumor, inflammation, very good. Rule, don't ever dilate a patient with a third nerve palsy. Somebody else is going to have to look at it and make some decisions. So, And this is something that gets violated in every optometry and ophthalmology residency across the country uh, every year. Never dilate a patient with a third nerve palsy. We need to be able to look at the pupils. All right, so partial third nerve palsy with pupil sparing, question mark, but it's partial. We always have to consider that to be an aneurysm, but the lack of head pain and lack of pupil involvement so was helpful in my threat assessment. And we also have to consider he's 94 years old. You know, but old Bob doesn't want to give up the ghost, but the male life expectancy is 80, you know, just over 80 years old. But he needs imaging. He needs a CT, CT, or MRI, MRA. And because of his age and health history, I actually had to work with the ER. I wanted it done through the ER. And they worked the best. They did their best. They, they couldn't do CTA because his kidneys couldn't take the contrast. They tried to uh, work around the pacemaker. They couldn't do that. So he only got a non-contrast enhanced brain CT or head CT because it's what they do. And they saw no bleed, which is actually helpful to me. You know, that's helpful. That kind of, that helps rule out the potential of a bleeding aneurysm. And they said he quote unquote had a stroke. Well, it's not really a brain stroke. It's more a cranial neuropathy stroke. So I put him out for the one week, don't fall through the crap spiral. But when I knew he was there, I went out to the waiting room to greet him because I wanted to see what he looked like. And this is what he looked like one week later. Now he has got a complete third nerve palsy. He has gone from looking like this to now looking like this. And we lift, lift up and you can see the pupils are indeed symmetrical, but this is what Bob looks like. So I lift the lid complete. He is down and out. You can see the pupils are symmetrical, cannot adduct, he can abduct, can't look up, can't look down, abducts well, does not adduct. So now Bob has, has progressed on from a partial third now to a complete third. Polling question number four. Now we got a serious problem. Do we agree or disagree? He's gone from partial palsy. Now he's got a complete palsy. He progressed on over the course of seven days. So, Joe, question. You know, you yeah. said, you know, I, I, I get the point because of the pupil involvement with a third. You know, people are going to dilate when double vision comes in, but is there really any benefit? I mean, other than maybe traumatic, looking for retinal issues, a fourth, a third, a sixth, is there really any benefit? I mean, I understand the benefit is that you, you in the third, that the pupil can progressively happen. But I mean, with all of today's imaging techniques, we can kind of see in the back of the eyes, are really any reason to dilate any of these neurogenics? <laughs> Well, sixth, you do want to because you're looking for disc edema. And the, the answer is you want to look. And you can do it with an undilated 90. You can do it with your camera. You can use, use your, your, your wide field imaging. You do want to take a look. Just don't dilate. But the presence of disc edema or, or other things that could be happening, you know, there may be multiple cranial nerve issues. It could be cranial nerve 2 involved. 
So it could it could be helpful. All right, so two thirds, or let's end the poll and share the results. Two thirds think we now have a serious problem. Uh, a third think that this is not a serious problem. And to be honest with you, if he didn't look like this in a week, I would be troubled. I was expecting him to progress on to a complete third if it were ischemic. So this progression kind of tells me it was ischemic. Now, the imaging was not great, but it didn't show any intracranial hemorrhage. Most likely felt at this point it was ischemic vascular. There should be about a 50% improvement in six weeks. He should be pretty well nearly recovered for in 12 weeks. But, of course, we're going to look for signs of aberrant regeneration, which could tell me that, indeed, he did have some compression. Now, this is Bob at 11 weeks. So he's got a little bit of ptosis. He can look up. He can look down. He abducted his eye. He can adduct his eye. He only has double vision when he's laying in bed looking at his clock right now, but it's only very little. He's one week short of 12 weeks, and he is pretty well recovered. He's a 70-year-old male. Sudden onset retroorbital pain followed by double vision for a week getting progressively work worse over that first week. He's hypertensive, diabetic, hypercholesterolemic, 2030, 2020. And this is a person I diagnosed in the waiting room. I saw him from across the room. I stepped in my front desk. He's got a complete ptosis. I know I've got a patient with a, a third nerve palsy. And unfortunately, this was the day before her, Hurricane Ian. Not this year, that was last year, and that was a big one for my area. We had to uh, we had to uh, really prepare because that hit us very badly. So the day before Hurricane Ian, he comes in looking like this. So complete palsy, or uh, complete ptosis. Lift up, you can see the pupils are symmetrical. He can abduct, he can can't add up, can't look up, can't look down. And this is, and you see the pupils are symmetrical. The important thing is they are also reactive. In the right lighting, you can have an anisocoria that diminishes. If you're in the right lighting, they could look the same. The important thing is the pupils are both reactive. On the patient microvascular risk factors, pupils spared, Complete ptosis. This is a person that, if it were not for a hurricane, I would get the imaging myself in the next day or so. A CT, CTA, or MR, MRA. Unfortunately, everything was shutting down, including us. So I had to work through the hospital to get this. I told them what to get. It was not an urgency. The likelihood that he uh, had an aneurysm was very low. And ultimately, it was ischemic. Imaging was normal. At about six weeks, he had markedly improved. Unfortunately, in these patients, it's usually the ptosis that resolves first, and that ends up giving them double vision. So he actually had a patch for the rest of the time, and he did completely recover because this was indeed ischemic. Now, here's a case. Beware of the pre-existing diagnosis. She was referred to me urgently for evaluation of Bell's palsy. Now, where did that come from? She she went to her she went to another eye doctor, and she says, "I've got Bell's palsy." She self-diagnosed it. And the person who saw the patient wasn't very comfortable with neuro op and asked me to see the patient. And here's a Bell's palsy patient. She's got a ptosis. I lift her up. She, she is she cannot look up. She can't look down. She can abduct. She can't adduct. I'm trying to show you. She had a fixed mid dilated pupil and she had head pain that was reactive. That was unreactive. So this was not a case of Bell's palsy. This was a patient 
who had a pupil involved third in her palsy. She got the Lightning Lane Disney Fast Pass right to the emergency room. I call the triage nurse. I'm explaining post as soon as I say posterior communicating artery aneurysm, that's when they're done. Could you hold on for a second? Let me get the, the doctor on uh, on the floor for you so you can discuss it. Okay. I suspect the worst. An OD goes to sees a patient with a third nerve palsy. Now, I was lecturing this in the Midwest somewhere, and somebody in the audience we actually shared, shared this case uh, with the audience. They saw a patient with a third nerve palsy in their practice. Plan was referred to ophthalmology the next day. I don't know what the status of the pupil was. Unfortunately, it was aneurysmal. The patient actually ruptured and died from a subarachnoid hemorrhage that night. Now, does the presence of vasculopathic risk factors help? Well, arteriosclerotic risk factors in an older person does favor a microvascular etiology, but is not protective against an aneurysm. Hypertension, diabetes, atherosclerosis, they're all very common. They don't protect against an aneurysm. So the answer is no. But it makes me very nervous when they're not present. Interesting case in point, I had a patient uh, with a, a, an acute sixth nerve palsy. Uh, his medical history was significant only for HIV infection, but it was well treated. He had no other medical history, no diabetes, no, no ischemic vascular palsies, or ischemic vascular diseases. And I knew his, his HIV practitioner, one of the top HIV practitioners, uh, in South Florida, a very nice guy, so I gave him a call and was talking to him about it because HIV is not a common cause of six nerve palsy. So we're discussing it, and I want to make it, you know, be sure that the patient had no ischemic vascular disease. And uh, his primary doctor said, no, he doesn't have anything wrong. And I can hear him shuffling papers. He said, no, but, you know, he actually has some high cholesterol and some high lipids here on, on his last visit. But I hear him shuffling papers that, yeah, he had some cholesterol issues the visit before, shuffle some more papers. Yep, he had it before. Yeah, so get him in here. I'm going to get him on statin. So he had undiagnosed hypercholesterolemia. Now, does the acuteness of presentation help? Kind of yes, kind of no. Aneurysm expansion is usually pretty acute, but they can slowly evolve. Chronic and evolving cases are well reported. So acute is worrisome. Chronic and improving is less worrisome, but it doesn't rule out an aneurysm. Resolve without recurring is what I like best. So risk assessment. Isolated third nerve palsy, isolated dilated pupil, there's no risk of aneurysm. If there's no lid mot or, or motility deficit, there's no aneurysm there. Complete third nerve palsy, normal pupil, low risk. Partial third nerve, normal pupil, high risk. Pupil involved third, that is a true emergency. You're never out of the woods. Patient had a third nerve palsy from an aneurysm. We talked about the treatment of aneurysm clip versus coil packing. Underwent a uh, successful aneurysm clip with craniotomy. Now, the interesting thing at this time, all those coils are inert and they're all MRI safe, but not at the time, not all clips were MRI safe. Radiologic tech didn't identify what type of clip was used. Undergoes a follow up MRI with a non MRI safe clip in a major Texas medical center. It displaced during the MRI, and the patient had a fatal hemorrhage and died during the MRI. So he survived the disease, but was killed by the follow up. Greg, is anything coming in through here? You are good. I just relaunched the hand out again. Oh, okay, very good. All right. Well, that's a lot of stuff to remember. So I'm going to try to make it easy for you with my O to a third. When the eye is down and out with ptosis, you better hope for meiosis. If the palsy is total with pupil sparing, in an oldie, it's vascular and not too daring. A partial palsy calls for double duty because it's probably an aneurysm going through puberty. But if the pupil is dilated and aneurysm is violated, no time for deferral and no time for referral. 
sent to the ER without debate because 20% will die in the first 48. And if you can remember that, that's all you really need to know. So if there's nothing else going on, or is there something else going on here, chat? It, it, uh, do cases that get discussed in law school, do cases the like answer, that get discussed in law school? The answer is likely no, because attorneys don't know the I, their, their words, not mine. And they don't like to get in, involved in I cases because there's just not a lot of money in there. He's a 35-year-old male referred to me for an evaluation for vertical double vision of two days duration. 2020 pupils normal, perimetry normal, a right hyperdeviation worse than left gaze and right head tilt, medical history normal, but he has the worst case of sinusitis ever, which began a week before his double vision. Diagnosis, he had a right fourth third palsy. Yes, 25-year-old woman involved in a minor auto accident hit by another driver. Very mild, almost like bumper cars. And I guess I'm probably dating myself. I don't think there's any bumper cars out there anymore. But nothing worse than that. Uh, no real damage to either car. They were, you know, she only had a mild to moderate bump. No head trauma, no loss of consciousness. Wake up the next morning, she had profound double vision. And she looks like this. You can see by the Purkinje images, she's got an extreme right hyper, worse on left gaze and right head tilt. This is a signature motility of a cranial nerve for palsy. So when suspecting cranial nerve palsy, and that's what you should suspect in virtually every case of vertical double vision. We have to ask, which eye is higher in primary gaze? Does the hyperdeviation worse in right or left gaze? And does it worse get worse with right or left head tilt? A fourth nerve palsy is a hyperdeviation, which is worse in opposite gaze and ipsilateral head tilt. And if you can say that, you're done. Vertical diplopia is a fourth nerve palsy until proven otherwise. Now, if it isn't, then it's probably a skew deviation. And we do something called supination testing. I'll explain that in just a little bit. Essentially, what will happen in skew deviation, which is midbrain disease, if you lay them back, their motility improves significantly. Fourth third palsy, laid back supination, it doesn't improve. Skew deviation does improve if you lay them back. Very common in kids can be congenital or traumatic. You're going to have an eye that's higher, you know, worse than an, an ipsa or a head tilt. Here's a nice example of a double fourth. You know, the, the, this little girl has a left fourth nerve palsy, and Dolly has a right fourth nerve palsy. I call this one a double palsy, double fourth. That brings me to polling question number five. What is the most common cause of fourth nerve palsy? Is it trauma? Is it idiopathic? Is it ischemic vascular? Or is there something wrong with the central nervous system like a tumor? You're all caught up with the questions. Yes. Anything you want to ask or share, Greg? Let's let's just take a nice long break because I feel like I'm I'm, I'm beating people into submission here. Hopefully, I'm not. I see a couple people smiling and so a few people scratching their heads. So. Okay. No, I like the point that, you know, vertical uh, diplopia, um, you know, is, is, you know, fourth nerve until proven otherwise. And so it's a pretty good rule of thumb. And also remember, you don't have to have all three steps of the parts three step. They don't always, all th they don't always completely obey. All right. I think uh, you've actually, I think if people have 
Got it exactly. Trauma, idiopathic, ischemic, vascular, and tumor. That's actually the uh, that's the dist distribution. It's the role of 40, 30, 20, 10. 40% 40 are traumatic, 30% are idiopathic, 20% are ischemic vascular, and 10% are something wrong, is something wrong with CNS like a tumor. It exits the midbrain posteriorly, goes around the brain stem, and it's the most exposed. It's the longest and most exposed. Thus, it is the most prone to trauma. You don't have to have eye trauma, head trauma. You can have contra coup trauma. You can, you can have whiplash trauma. People fall and hit the back of their head can cause this. Conversely, three and six are relatively protected. It takes a lot of trauma to get a third or a sixth. It doesn't take much trauma to get a fourth. Now, these patients can actually have decompensation, can be very long standing. What you're looking for is the head tilt. Either head tilt from pictures, head tilt in the office. They're going to the opposite side, trying to make the imbalance more comfortable. Very commonly, if you, if you, if you check their vertical vergences, because they've been exercising so long to fuse, They've got pretty strong vertical vergences. I tell people to do that. I never do that myself. I never check vergences. One thing in new onset fourth nerve palsies, they do respond very well to prism, but do not prescribe permanent prism until you give them several weeks to several months. Use either a patch or use a Fresnel press-on prism. Don't grind it in until you they they until you follow them for I would say probably three months, because sometimes these will just go away. Now managing these patients, isolated, non-traumatic. Look for ischemic vascular diseases, but remember the bad ones, bad things are not that common. And look for evidence of, of long-standing uh, decompensation with a head tilt, or maybe even look at vertical vergences. Now, going to our 35-year-old male, what were the possible etiologies? The, the young female was traumatic, but a 35-year-old male, options are myasthenia gravis, multiple sclerosis, ischemia, sort of infectious disease, compressive lesion, sarcoid, but remember, he had the worst sinusitis that he ever had a week before he double vision, spatial temporality. What happens in time or space? Likely, we had erosion of inflammation from the adjacent sinus outcome. As his sinusitis was treated, his double vision went away. Here's a different patient with a different prognosis, 73-year-old male. And this was one of my new program, one of my first patients in my new practice. I do the neuro op in our practice. This is one of the first ones that I actually saw after I got down to center for sight. 73-year-old male, new onset vertical double vision. He's got a left fourth nerve palsy. He's relieved by two prism diopters based down. We can get him a Fresnel prism. However, he mentioned, Doc, you know, my gripper is off. So he's got mild left-handed weakness. Now we're not dealing with an isolated palsy. Now we have a hemiparesis, uh, upper motor neuron issue here. Medical history, he's treated for lung cancer. He is thought to be in remission, but he's currently on maintenance chemotherapy. Now, in my entire career, this is one of the few fourth nerve palsies I remember neuroimaged. I remember I saw him on a Thursday. By Monday, he was in the hospice from brain metastases. What is the best treatment of fourth nerve palsy in prison? Does not work anymore. Surgery. Get him to a good adult uh, strabismus surgery. But we have to make sure that it is indeed stable. So now we diagnose idiopathic or ischemic anything in a patient with a history of cancer. Cancer is cancer until proven otherwise, particularly with neuroophthalmic disease. Now, there is a big difference between a woman who was treated 25 years ago 
uh, for breast cancer with mastectomy versus a man treated last year for prostate cancer. Cancer is cancer until proven otherwise. So never diagnose idiopathic or ischemic anything neuro-ophthalmically if they have a history of cancer. We have to consider it's a recurrence of that disease. I call this one motility madness, diagnosing at 65 miles per hour. I was in South Florida. I was driving to a conference when a close friend calls me for uh, for help. Patient's a 36-year-old male, sudden onset, non-fourth neuropalsy with vertical double vision and an exodeviation, but no ptosis. Now, my friend was worried because he saw him three weeks ago and the exam was normal. And his worry is, what did I miss? Did I did I miss anything? Now, I'm in South Florida. Weather is great. They're in a raging blizzard up in the Northeast. Can't get to a neuro-ophthalmologist. Maybe can get to a hospital emergency room. So what is it? What's the most likely cause? And what do we do about it? All right? So raging blizzard, new onset, young person, non-fourth neuropalsy, vertical double vision, Bit of an exodeviation, no ptosis. Well, here's the pertinent information. He was normal three weeks earlier. He's 36 years old. Very few things happen that age, but they include demyelinating disease and neuromuscular disease. No evidence of a third nerve palsy, so it's not an aneurysm. Doesn't fit the pattern of uh, a fourth nerve palsy. That would be too easy. Six neuropalsy would be horizontal. Now, always remember, small vertical dissociations can actually allow an underlying ESO or exophoria to manifest. Person may be exophoric, strong exo, and they 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 fuse very well. And all of a sudden, they get a little vertical deviation, can't fuse any longer. Now they're out like this, and it really isn't the this part. It's the this part, the vertical part that we're looking for. And skew deviations often accompany six nerve palsy. So suspect he had a skew deviation. It's not an emergency, but an ER is a good place to assess, particularly in a in a snowstorm. Call they need a brain MRI, rhythm out contrast, looking for infarct, which would be unlikely, and demyelinization, which would be likely. Also, anti-acetylcholinesterin antibodies uh, need to be ordered. He was seronegative for myasthenia, but he did have mesencephalic white matter lesions consistent with MS, and he had a skew deviation. This is an insult, the posterior cranial fossa, includes a number of things, older people infarct, younger people multiple sclerosis. So, after performing the PARC's three-step test, you can recline the patient and check the vertical imbalance. If it improves, you're dealing with a skew deviation, and they need an MRI looking for posterior cranial fossil disease. Probably autolithic projection from vestibular nucleus are crossing the midline at the, at the ponds along the MLF. Skew deviation disrupts your reticular ocular reflex, which detects change in the head posture. You're laying back, they actually get a little bit better. That was a mouthful. So to help you out, I want to share with you my own to vertical diplopia. When your patient sees double up and down, it's rarely a cause to frown. Look for a tilt and prove it's old. And remember, vertical vertices will be bold. It's a fourth until proven otherwise. Trauma congenital idiopathic, you should surmise. But if it's not a fourth and it's new, laying back, it's probably askew. And if you can remember that, that's really all that you need for vertical double vision. Greg, how are we doing? Would a split prism with fourth nerve palsy based on affected eye and based up the other eye or just based down the affected eye? The answer is, Kenneth, if I'm grinding it in, we split the prism. If I'm doing a Fresnel, I put it all in one because a Fresnel kind of distorts their vision a little bit. Good question. 
All right, 75 year old female, sudden painless onset double vision, worse at distance and left gaze. I don't think that she told me that I elicited it. But I was headache, jaw claudication, tear, and weight loss. And when I lost weight loss, she guffawed at me. So I, I, I took it that she's got a good appetite. She's not insulin dependent, diabetic, and hypertensive. She has no vision change, 20 30 commensurate with her cataract. Fundus is normal. She has no disc edema. Obviously, she doesn't know how to wear the mask during COVID. We can see that we have a strong ESO deviation, and she's got six nerve palsy. Horizontal double vision, greater distance with an abduction deficit. Now, when we consider this, we have to check that we're doing motilities at distance. Don't get face-to-face with the patient, have them look somewhere at your chart at a distance. Because if you're testing them up close, they have to converge. They can, that can hide a very subtle six nerve palsy. This is the one we usually do for suction testing and see if we can move it out. They don't like it. I don't like doing it. I don't generally do it. I look for asymmetric refixation. I'll explain what that is in just a second. So let's take a look at her. She doesn't abduct well. She looks great there. Doesn't look great there. Under action, can look up, but it's still ESO in distance. Now, watch her movements when we do the alternate cover test at distance. Slow movement. Snap. Slow movement. Snap. Slow movement, snap, slow movement. And this is Herring's law, equal innervation. This eye is, is normal. It knows how much innervation to get out to my target. This eye is abnormal. The same amount of inter innervation that this eye gets is given to this eye. It isn't enough. It has to find it. Let's try to look at it again. Slow out, glissade, saccade. Glides out, boop, right there. Glides out, boop, right there. See how it kind of goes halfway? The brain knows how much it needs to get out. When it gives the same amount here, it's not enough. It still has to pick up the target. Asymmetric refixation is neurogenic. And we just talked about that. Question, point, question number six. Should you know image? Yes or no? So, Joe, I'm going to echo. I'm going to echo your pearl because it. I almost fell into that, and luckily, you know, I've heard you lecture numerous times. Literally four weeks ago, six nerve palsy comes in, and here I am sitting in front of the patient, going, "Follow my, follow my light," and I'm like, you know, she's she's got the complaints side by side. Hey doc, when I look at you or whatever, I see you side by side, nothing up and down, no side by side. And here I am sitting three feet and I go, oh, hold on. And I walked back, did a little bit of motility, but then had them fixate on the eye chart, isolated a letter and man, did it jump out. And then about three weeks later, you know, or two weeks later, it really manifested mm -hmm. into a, into a, where the eye didn't move out. I mean, her eye was able to move past that, uh, I guess, uh, AB duct pretty good, but about seven days later, it was pretty much stuck. So exactly. And, and that's what, that's what I would anticipate. Now, I haven't, you know, look, you know, look at, at a distant target, right gaze, left gaze, alternate cover test. And that's what I will, I will neutralize with, uh, with prison bar if I decide to do, to do that. But I'm, you know, I just want to echo. I mean, that's just a, mm -hmm. that's a pearl and a half or two pearls, because when you're in the heat of the moment and you're small exam lane, we're just so used to holding that transluminar right here. So you got <laughs> that side by side double vision, get them on the eye chart, get them at distance. So the question is, should she be neural imaged and 68% say yes, 32% say no. And the interesting thing is, even the ophthalmologists can't argue, can't agree on this one. 
So uh, nobody, nobody, nobody's wrong on that one. You, you, you'll get different from different people. Here's the, another fellow right here. Very, very bad diabetic, almost to the point where he was, he, he was just short of comatose. He comes right from the Ukraine from the war. Very, very bad diabetic. Abduction deficit. And we take a look. I saw him follow up. Okay, wake up. There we go. Snap. Glide. Snap. Glide. Snap. The brain knows how much the normal eye needs an innervation. It gives it to this eye. It's not enough. It has to work to pick it up. Asymmetric refixation, that's neurogenic. I don't, that, that's why I don't do the force duction test. If it were entrapment, muscle, anything like that, it would move equally fast, just not all the way out. So managing six, each case should be classified as traumatic or non-traumatic. And you know, tra trauma, you've got to have a really bad trauma. Non-traumatic should be identified as isolated, just the six nerve palsy, or not isolated. There's something else going on as well, like a Horner syndrome or a, a fourth nerve palsy or third nerve palsy. And we have to determine, is it a child, a young adult, or an older adult? Now, child, right, prepubescent. Young adult, puberty up to about 40 or 50. Older adults, 50 and above. Older adults, six nerve palsy, usually not bad. Vascular disease is pretty common. They have ischemic vascular diseases. Always considered giant self. They're over the age of 50 or 60 years. Children may be bad. About 50% are malignant diseases, typically pontine glioma. And young adults, you know, from puberty up to about age 50, is usually a bad thing. Vascular disease, idiopathics, not likely. But they're usually complicated. They're usually hemiparesis, a Horner syndrome, a facial paralysis, cerebral vascular accidents involving the pons, aneurysms of the cavernous sinus, uh, cavernous sinus tumors, and demyelinating disease are the de rigueur of these, these younger people. But younger people usually don't have isolated sex. They usually have complicated sex. There's something else going on. So, so let me ask a question at, there. Yeah. Let me ask a question. Go back about your consider the GCA. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously, the patient didn't have a central retinal artery occlusion. This is a sixth nerve older patient. That's what mine was. Um, I did not work up, but. I kind of did the old, you know, the, your, uh, uh, you know, I kind of went through the stair comb chair there and went through the patient and you can remind me of what all those different, all those are, but she didn't have those. So I did not work her up for GCA kind of history, talk to her, um, able to chew really well. She doesn't have pain when she combs her hair, all that stuff. And uh, is that, is, is that acceptable? No way. No, no, it's fine. I in the last several months, one person with a six nerve palsy that turned out to be giant saw arthritis. It isn't common, but it does happen. Now, if you don't have any any sort of underlying systemics, the likelihood that it's GCA is probably pretty low. So I, I guess what I'm asking is should we work them up yeah. if they're above it, or should you know you have to consider there? I didn't work mine up, so uh, you know, so it's always a consider you did the right thing, you did the history. Okay. And if if the, if the if it, and I'll, I'll share with you probably toward the end what my, what was unique about my patient uh, why we why I ended up uh, working them up. Now, in your case, I don't think anything beyond a good history was necessary. So I think you did you did well with that one. Perfect. Thanks. So we we have to look at it. is it non isolated? Is there a facial paralysis? A third? Is there something else going on? If that's the case, they need a full evaluation. If it's isolated in an older patient, you can monitor them. If it's isolated in a child, they should be referred to a pediatric neurologist because there's a 50% chance they have malignant disease. If they're young adults and it's isolated, you have to watch them very carefully. 
But those are people who probably should be uh, neuroimaged. Now we're looking for a mass cause of six nerve palsy. Two places where a tumor can hide and give you an isolated six is at the base of the pons and in the cavernous sinus. So if you're looking at to tell the radiologist where to look, those are the two places where a tumor can hide and cause an isolated six. Now, if you think you've got something that is a, pre a presumptive ischemic sixth nerve palsy and you're wrong, you probably haven't heard the patient. There's no thing out there that's going to be rapidly fatal to a patient. And I hate to say this and be coarse about it. If it's something that's going to kill the patient, it's going to kill them sooner, sooner or later. And you, you've not done anything wrong. Now, there's a lot of stuff to remember here. I'm going to share with you my up to a sixth. Well, the double is side by side, and abduction does not abide. Bring it to six with porch duction test. Eliminate muscle, thyroid, and all the rest. In kids and young adults, it's a worry. Get a scan, you better hurry. But in old, you're practically free. Give them a patch and check to see it's better in three. And that's really all that you need to know. Now, I'm going to jump ahead some really useful neuro-op nonsense. The sagging eye syndrome. Actually, let's do the person in the, in the chat box for me. Has anybody heard of sagging eye syndrome? Some people call it saggy eye syndrome. Sagging, saggy, both are very bad terms or very ugly terms. Have you ever heard this before? Has anybody come across this before? Put it in the chat. I hear no, no. A lot of no's out there. All right. Well, almost everybody's telling me no. Tim saw, said yes. Kenneth said yes. Now we're about 50-50. Diana. All right. Let's talk about sagging eye syndrome. I probably diagnose this maybe twice a month. We talk about nerve, we talk about muscle, we talk about neuromuscular junction. What we have to talk about is now tendon. There is a tendon, the lateral rectus, superior rectus band. It connects the lateral rectus and superior rectus together. With age, there is a deformity, and it can actually stretch or rupture, giving you horizontal double vision. These are people who can have baggy eyelids, very deep sulcus. Uh, they may have had a history of blepharoplasty or other cosmetic surgery, and they present with a horizontal double vision. So sagging eye syndrome is a, a mechanical cause of acquired adult Mostly horizontal, but it can be vertical as well. It's an age-related orbital connective tissue degeneration. This lateral rectus, superior rectus band, it will stretch or it'll rupture. MRI is not diagnostic. It's only confirmatory. What are the co common findings and complaints that I see? They're older. They often have a deep-set sulcus. Maybe they've had blepharoptosis, uh, blepharoplasty. It's horizontal double vision. Tends to be worse when they're tired. Mostly notice when they're driving, particularly at night, when they look left and right at their side view mirrors. Also, they're watching TV at distance if they're tired. And particularly if you're watching like a sports game, like tennis, they're going back and forth, left and right, left and right, basketball, football, something like that. It's a whole, it, they're ESO at distance and either ortho or exo at near. MRI is confirmatory, it's not diagnostic. And these are people who are treated best with prism. Now, I usually have a wow factor. When I hold a, a loose prism in front of them, they, they really respond to it, they feel more comfortable. So, the characteristic finding ESO at distance. A little bit exo or ortho at near, deep set sulcus, usually when they're driving, horizontal at distance, looking left, looking right, and watching TV. I probably diagnose this about twice a month. 
And it's generally, by, by and large, it is covenant. They don't have a muscle restriction. Now, I'm going to move on to the brainstem motilities. We're not going to spend a heck of a lot of time here. But it's important to, to recognize and understand these. Brainstem disease, Abby somewhat, Abby normal. We have the internuclear ophthalmoplegia. We have the binocular internuclear ophthalmoplegia. The wall eye binocular internuclear ophthalmoplegia. The one and a half syndrome, we talked about skew. I'm not going to talk about that again. I'm going to try to keep out, Greg, if I start going in the weeds, stop me, okay? We're going to talk about the brain. We're going to talk about a little bit about the brain stem anatomy. And I'm going to break it down and tell you what you need to know and try to simplify it. In order to look left and right, in order to look left, we have to have a lateral rectus working, which is cranial nerve six. We have to have a medial rectus, which is cranial nerve three. They both have to be working simultaneously and equally. The problem is they're not next door neighbors. Three is way up here in the doors of mesencephalon, and six is way down here in the pines. That's a lot of distance there. How can these two not next door neighbors talk to one another? Will they talk via this neural superhighway called the medial longitudinal fasciculus? That is a pathway from here up to here. Now, there's also something called the PPRF, or parapontine reticular formation. That's a supranuclear control center of horizontal eye movements. You want to look to the left. The brain has to, has to tell you your eyes to work. The brain tells the PPRF. It has to signal the, the sixth nerve. Then go all the way up here on this neural superhighway and signal the third nerve to look left. So there's a lot of area here. Internuclear thalmoplegia. Something happens to shut down that superhighway. So we got the parapontine reticular formation. This is a supranuclear control center. This is horizontal gaze. Brain, you want to look to the, patient wants to look to the left. Brain has to work. Brain works with a PPRF. It goes to the lateral rectus nucleus, sends a signal, goes to the lateral rectus. It goes to the paraabductions nucleus here, which now gets on the superhighway called the MLF and goes all the way up to the midbrain. Now it's a medial rectus to work. Well, what happens is that highway gets shut down from infarct, from demyelinization. Something happens. So we want to look left. The sixth nerve works, but the message doesn't get out. This eye doesn't AD duck. It doesn't move in. And this eye, in response, goes into an abducting nystagmus. That's an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. You've got brain stem disease, demyelization, or stroke. That's it. That's all you got to know. You got to know where to look, what to look for. So when the patient looks one direction, it all works well. They look the other direction. They cannot AD duct, and this eye goes into an abducting nystagmus. There are no medial rectal palsy. Say it with me. Everybody, say it. There are no medial rectus palsies. Greg, say it with me. There are no there are medial, no rectus, medial palsies. rectus palsies. Amen. All right. It's an internuclear thalmoplegia. You start looking for that jiggly eye out there. When that happens, you got midbrain disease. You know what the radiologist to look for. If they're older, it's stroke. If they're younger, it's MS. And we can have it where it affects both. All right, we have an internuclear thalmoplegia on this side. We have an internuclear thalmoplegia on this side. Both superhighways are shut down. 
Younger people, demyelinating disease. Older people, infarct. Could be drug toxicity. So younger people, demyelinating disease. And we also have to consider myasthenia gravis. And it could just mimic an ina. Older people, could be myasthenia, could be ischemic vascular infarct. Now, here's a pretty interesting, wicked one. I'm sorry, this is a little bit blurred. It's the best one I could come up with. The one and a half syndrome. They hit, they have a gaze paresis in one direction and internuclear abdominal paresis in the other. What happens? The PPRF on one side works pretty well. It can turn an eye out, but there's a breakdown of the MLF. So it goes into an internuclear abdominal. The side doesn't add up. But the PPRF on the other side is not working. They want to look to the right. It's getting no signal at all to either one. It's a gaze paresis. They can't look one side. They can look the other. That goes into an abducting nystagmus. And there is an adduction deficit. Again, pontine disease. That's probably about all we need to know on this one. Now, when assessing abdominal paresis, don't forget the imposters. There's infiltrative disease, thyroid ophthalmopathy. You can have lymphoma and cancer. Greg does a great talk on thyroid eye disease. I'm not going to traipse into that. That's his, that's his Sergeant Peppers. I let him handle that. We always have to consider infiltrative disease, but we also have to consider neuromuscular disease and myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia grabs with these mavic antibodies that will block the postsynaptic receptors. Normally, the action potential comes down here. It releases neurotransmitter acetylcholine. It acts with the receptors postsynaptically on the muscle, and the nerve transmits normally. In myasthenia, these antibodies will block the receptors. The acetylcholine does not interact with receptors. Acetylcholinesterase will break down that acetylcholine, and the nerve potential doesn't uh, propagate. So there's antagonism and inhibition, and there's muscle weakness. I'm going to tell you right now. I don't know why. I've got my I've got my theories, but. I'm seeing more myasthenics than I, in the last two years than I've seen in the last 10 years. And the only thing I can think of is that this is an autoimmune disease and we have just gone through COVID. Not saying that's the cause. I'm just saying I probably test once a week for myasthenia. Systemic disease, often of the thymus gland, it's usually young women and older men, the same demographic you see in a strip club, but it can also occur in older women and younger men, so basically really any age. There's an ocular form and a systemic form. Systemic forms can actually be fatal. Ocular form only involves the muscles of the, of the eye and the eyelid. If it's ocular for two years, it will always be ocular. It won't, it won't, will not convert to general myasthenia. 90% of systemic or general myasthenics will develop eye signs. 70% of those patients will develop life-threatening disease. It will affect the extracted muscles, the abiculars oculi, the levator. It will not affect the pupil. Pupil is never involved. And these are people that can prevent with painless variable double vision and ptosis. Isolated mu muscle weakness, inferior bleak, medial rectus, there is no medial rectus palsies, superior rectus, tarsus, pupil sparing third nerve palsy, fourth nerve palsy, sixth nerve palsy, skew deviation, multiple cranial neuropathies, or pseudo items. It can, it's a big mimicker. We always have to consider this in cranial nerve disease. There is a variability in presentation. 
Diagnosis can be done with Tensilon. I don't, we don't, we don't do that uh, very often. Ice pack test to cool the uh, cool the enzyme off. But ultimately, what we want to do is we want to test for the the antibodies, blinding, blocking, blocking and modulating. Patients can be seropositive, they have the disease, and it shows up serologically. They can be seronegative. They have the disease, but it doesn't show up serologically. We make the diagnosis based upon suspicion and response to treatment. About 12% of myasthenic patients are seronegative. Mostly have ocular myasthenia. It's always a differential diagnosis of ophthalmopheresis. Now I'm going to share with this fellow. I actually, uh, I actually talked myself into something. We don't, we don't ever want to do that. I broke my own rules. He's an 84-year-old male, two-day history of dizziness. He had gone to the ER, and blood work and and uh, a CT scan were normal. He's got some onset horizontal and some vertical double vision. We can see he has an adduction deficit. Now, we know there are no adduction uh, medial rectus palsies. Let's take a look at him. He looks left over here very well, but he doesn't adduct well. He looks up very well. He has no ptosis. He looks down. He doesn't have a third nerve palsy. And I convinced myself he had a little bit of an abducting nystagmus. And I convinced myself of that. So my belief is he has an internuclear ophthalmoplegia. He probably has a midbrain infarct. We need to get neuroimaging done. I neuroimage him. It comes back perfectly normal. And a week later, he is perfectly normal. His double vision is gone. His motility is normal. At this point, I test him for myasthenia. Everything comes back normal, but the blocking antibodies were elevated close to borderline. In my opinion, he is a seronegative ocular myasthenic. It's going to show up eventually sometime. But remember, there are no medial rectus palsies. Now, I'm going to wrap up with a case and a few simple rules. Here is a 69-year-old male. I've had several patients like this in the past several weeks. I think this is uh, I think this is pretty uh, pretty important learning case right here. 69-year-old male, two-week history of vertical double vision. He's got left vertical hyperphoria, but the rest of his Parks three step was negative. So my diagnosis tentatively is a possible fourth nerve palsy or, or a variation of sagging eye syndrome. But it wasn't really consistent in the office. One prison-based sound, left eye, he was more comfortable. So I applied Fresnel prison to his current prescription. He's 20-30 in each eye posterior chamber ILO, mild posterior capsular pacification. So vertical double vision, generally don't worry, doesn't look to be a skew deviation, might be a sagging eye, put a prism on him. A month later, comes back in our, our schedule file, prism only helps a little bit. Now, refraction, he has less appropriate when the prism is increased to two base down, but he still has blurred vision, so I refract him, put prism in the frother. He sees better, but he's still having double vision. And at one point he mentioned, I'm getting a little concerned here, which means, are you sure you know what you're doing? So the inconsistent and variability, I decided we're going to test him for myasthenia gravis. Now, patients who I think might be seronegative ocular myasthenics, usually have one test that is pretty close, to, you know, is elevated and pretty close to being abnormal. None of his tests were even close. They were rock bottom. Call and tell him the results. 
I asked him how he's doing. He said, he's still doing well. Bring him back a month later, very happy with prison, no double vision when wearing prison, wants a new refraction and prison ground, ground into his glasses. More of the story, sometimes it's just double vision. Sometimes it is not, it's not always an aneurysm. It's not always a tumor. It's not always an infarct. You know, I work with neuro-ophthalmologists. I can't tell you the number of times I see a diagnosis of double vision or optic neuropathy and nothing more. Sometimes it's just double vision. Now, could it be other things? Pamica, Valley Abuse, Nancy Newman and Associates actually looked at patients with basically microvascular uh, cranial nerve palsies. They found that when they worked them up, there are some patients, particularly third nerve palsies, who actually had other things going on, including tumors, giant cell, brain stem. And their conclusion was, when we do a double vision workup, uh, we should always consider brain MRI, sed rate C reactive protein, and acetylcholine receptor antibodies. We consider those in our workup. So I'm going to start bringing it down. We're about to touch down. I'm going to give you my, my cheat sheet and my final rules. Horizontal double vision is virtually always a six nerve palsy. There are no medial rectus palsies. We say it with me again and again. It's either an internuclear ophthalmoplegia, it's entrapment of thyroid, or it's myasthenia. So horizontal is a sixth. We don't have medial rectus palsy. Nearly all third nerve palsies will get some form of imaging. You have to have a good reason not to image a third nerve palsy. You know, older person, vasculopathic risk factors, complete palsy, people sparing, no pain. Maybe that's a person that can skate. Vertical double vision is a fourth, almost always could be askew. Nobody does force duction testing for vertical double vision. And third nerve palsy don't just cause double vision birth. Sudden onset palsies can be vascular pathic, but it could be something else. We should always be aware of the lipids, blood sugars, and blood pressures work with their internists. Sed rate C reactive protein can be done uh, and plain screen done. Contrast enhanced MRI, definitely if they're under the age of 50. Always consider anticholinesterase antibodies and follow them up in six weeks looking for improvement. If they have a complicated or multiple cranial nerve palsies or other neurological issues going on, they should be evaluated with a scan. Now, let's wrap it up. Isolated, and you can, you can chant this like a mantra, microvascular palsies are allowed to get worse over a week and to be no better at two weeks that they're not allowed to get worse over two weeks. If you're ever worried, I expect them to get worse in a week. Greg, you're, you said your patient got worse in a week? Absolutely, yep. That is typical for an ischemic vascular palsy. If it does behave like that, it might not be ischemic. They can be no better at two weeks. They can't progressively get worse over two weeks. And generally speaking, when they're ischemic, they don't do anything for about the first month. For about the first month, if you bring them in, you're watching paint dry. It is boring. They don't do anything for about a month. But in about six weeks, you should have some improvement. If they get better in less time than that, you need to start thinking about it. Now, I'll share with the case. I, I mentioned it. Patient had a sixth nerve palsy, isolated. He was in his 60s, and he had retroorbital pain. It all made sense for ischemic vascular palsy. I told him, you're going to get worse in the course of the next week. I want you to go to the medical supply store in my plaza and get an eye patch. So I bring him back in about 10 days. Comes back in about 10 days. Not only is he not worse, he's actually better. He's actually improved. 
almost pra practically gone. That doesn't follow like a six nerve palsy ischemia. And now her retroorbital pain is more consistent with a headache. All right, so we redirect. I order the send rate C reactor protein and uh, platelets, and they do come back elevated for temporal arteritis. He was actually ultrasound negative, but he was incredibly responsive. What was the key? It got better too fast. Giant cell arteritis is the most common chronic vasculitis in the elderly. Giant cell can actually improve. It can self-limit. Sometimes patients are blind, but it can self-limit. So if something doesn't behave like an ischemic palsy, it gets better too quickly, comes and goes, that's a key you should think about giant cell. It's the most common chronic vasculitis. And always remember, inflammations, cancers, and aneurysms have been reported to improve spontaneously. So beware of when they improve and recur. They may need more of an evaluation. Greg, did that kind of go along with what we uh, we talked about in your six nerve case? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. So, I mean, Greg, if, if the patient got better in a week, I would tell you, you, you should look for something else. Mm -hmm. He got worse in a week. That's expected. He's no better in a month. That's expected. Six weeks, we should have close to 50% improve. Yep. So it's the pathway we're following right now. So absolutely staying about the same. Yep. If they and, and they should take that long. If it doesn't take that long, doesn't follow that course, it's probably not a scheme. So with that, I'm gonna say may all your policies be isolated, live long and prosper. And Greg, let's land this and go home. Yeah, there was a, a a a quick case came in. I'm not sure if you want to get, try and give a quick consult on it. Um, sure. It says, I'm curious what Joe would suggest for a 57-year-old white woman who complains of vertical only while playing tennis, but not every time she plays. Seems to be worse on up gaze, at, uh, better at near, mild brow ache reported just before the onset. And when stops, it resolves shortly after. Uh, impossible to diagnose in the office because 2020, 2020, and basically said no rush here, maybe reply later, so on and so forth. And then there was a PS down here. Patient has no vascular disease, uh, only uh, paroxymal AFib, uh, only no meds. So when playing tennis, jarring, up and down, double vision. By and large, my first thought, sagging eye syndrome. And how do I know? It happens to me. And, and, and I think we've talked about it, Greg. I get a vertical double vision. I do certain things physically like that outside. Yeah, I, I would say it's sagging eye syndrome. I, I really would not worry about it. Kind of the same thing happens to me. Excellent. So that would be, so, a, a, if they wanted to test, would that be kind of, uh, what is that? That's uh, ESO at distance. And then when they go to near, it would be EXO. So maybe that type of testing. Well, it doesn't even have to be that. Sometimes, sometimes it's vertical. Okay. My, mine is actually vertical. But that jarring nature probably tells me it's muscular. And they feel it's coming on. Yeah, you, you can actually feel the 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 the, uh, the muscle or the tendon. So I really wouldn't worry about that. I think that's actually a sagging eye. Perfect. Thank you. Well, Joe, you did a great job. Um, yeah, obviously, this is your, you, know, you always say, my Sergeant Peppers, this is your Sergeant Peppers, and I truly am glad to be able to phone a friend when I need you. Um, you cer certainly make this neuro easy, which is what I think we need for optometry because there's not enough neuro-ophthalmologists. And when you work with the neuro-ophthalmologist, um, that you've introduced me to, um, they know they know that we need optometry to be able to do this. So thank you for continuing to help optometry with this because someone's going to save a life someday, and I know I have. So thank you for a, a great webinar on Dr. IC Double, Diagnosing and Managing Patients with Neurogenic Diplopia. Great job.